All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jack Barber, and with me today is uh, my colleague, Brian. Um, we are both uh, management consultants at, uh, consultants at Exotech, and we're going to be sharing our experiences regarding common challenges that system integrators face while they're growing their business. Um, as the old adage goes, everything changes, no exceptions. So uh, it should be no surprise that as uh, system integration organizations grow uh, to take on more business and larger projects, uh, so too must the organization itself, not just in the number of people, but also in the way that we manage the organizations and, and lead those people to uh, be successful in growing the business. Um, now, uh, every business is different. Um, uh, but we're going to review some of the kind of common phases that businesses go through, um, challenges they face, and, you know, uh, likely evolutions uh, uh, of the organization. Um, and we'll discuss the kind of different approaches and common pitfalls to these, uh, you know, strategies um, as you attempt to grow your business. Um, for reference sake, um, here's a, a couple of kind of uh, – industry articles and, and publications about this. Um, according to Vern Hardish in his bush, book, Scaling Up, there are roughly 28 million businesses in the US, and that's not just SIs, but that's all businesses, uh, of which there are only about 4% that even make it to 1 million in sales. And of the businesses that make it to 1 million in sales, only about one out of 10, or now we're at 0.4% of all businesses ever make it to $10 million and similar sort of iterations. Uh, and only 17,000 companies out of that uh, 28 million uh, made it to more than 50 million. Um, and the data shows that it's for the US, but the data shows it's similar in other countries. Um, there's another study by a professor from, uh, called Larry, uh, Dr. Larry Greiner. Uh, he published this in the Harvard Business Review and it's uh, entitled Evolution and Revolutions as Organizations Grow. Uh, he talked about the crises that happen that are common barriers for the company to companies to to grow uh, on this progression, um, and that's kind of where the inspiration from this presentation uh, began. Uh, we kind of took that um, frame of reference and applied it specifically to the system integration business. Um, in 2020, we gave a presentation to uh, the CSI community that we called the hurdles presentation. It's on our um, uh, resources section of the exotech.com website. Um, if you want to kind of learn more about that in particular, then, you know, uh, I provided the link there at the bottom of the slide. Um, and this presentation is really taking that perspective, these hurdles, and looking specifically at what does that mean to kind of the people and how they orient themselves to overcome these challenges. Brian, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, this has uh, been a model that has been around for quite a while. And uh, one of the things we see, although every every company is different and they have their own particular circumstances, uh, these various hurdles that uh, you see along the way tend to be common across all companies. The one thing that uh, you might point out here is that uh, the hurdles don't necessarily, you know, uh, track linearly or serially the, the way you see there and necessarily in that order it, uh, it can come in uh, different combinations but uh, the basic gist of it is that yeah there, you do experience these hurdles and in order to grow and evolve you do have to get past them yeah but saying them in a particular order makes for a nicer story Brian. so yeah, there you we're, go. we're gonna we're gonna go with that today but uh, you're right. absolutely right different things for different organizations will become important but um we'll use this uh kind of parable, if you will, to kind of talk through based on what we've seen in hundreds of system integrators. This is the, the, this is uh, kind of typical ways that things happen. So we'll start with what we call the entrepreneurial phase. Uh, a system integration company tends to be started by a technical entrepreneur uh, that starts uh, the business based around their own expertise. Um, the, the entrepreneur gradually begins adding engineers as they outstrip their own ability to do, do the work. Often that's friends or colleagues that kind of join into the business um, in, in this phase. It, it, it's likely to grow to say maybe five or 10 people uh, and uh, cross maybe the $1 million uh, revenue barrier. Uh, and, and then it becomes, you know, they become interested in how, how to continue to grow, how to get kind of be up to two and beyond 2 million. Um, but, uh, the, the business at this point is really focused on 
the projects themselves, just the individual projects and, and not particularly the process. They're using kind of tech, their technical acumen and just hustle to, to get each project done. Um, and without uh, any real processes involved, um, some projects are profitable and others may be quite frankly very unprofitable. And it seems like kind of one step forward, maybe two steps back, um, and, uh, you know, cash seems to be tight. Everybody's working hard, but the company just doesn't seem to really be moving forward um, in this kind of early, early phase. And, and the leaders, uh, you know, oftentimes they're like, man, if we just hit that one home one project, then, you know, that'll save the company and we can finally breathe and be, you know, be successful. So let's talk about kind of some of the people considerations in this phase, Brian, um, uh, for, you know, one thing that you should kind of keep in mind is the entrepreneur at this point is, you know, really responsible for every aspect of the business. They're they're wearing, you know, all the hats, right? They uh, um, and uh, like I said, the rest of the, his uh, his or her staff is just focused on whatever project that they've been they're marshalling resources to and and their own efforts to try to make successful. Um, uh, the business from the business side of things, the technical entrepreneur is probably winging it. Um, you know, they know the technical stuff great, but they're just trying to figure out the business stuff. Is that consistent with your thoughts, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, a lot of you know what's driving the business in many cases typically relies back on the owner to get it up. You know, and typically they'll get it up to the to the uh, capacity and bandwidth of the owner in terms of size. But uh, the other thing you'll often see at this at size too is that uh, uh, you know typically projects tend to be a little bit smaller. Uh, engineers tend to be working. You see a lot more lone ranger type projects in a lot of cases. Um, but uh, you know they start to uh, you know once you start to grow past that, then they start to gel a little bit more, develop more of a team environment. But at this stage, it's uh, heavily the business yeah. heavily dependent on the owner and uh, a lot of lone ranger type stuff. Yeah, and I think it's that lone ranger mentality, Brian, that you're talking about that. Um... You know, you tend to kind of look for the unicorns, the kind of jack of all trades that that you can kind of entrust the entirety of a project. Those and those folks are really hard to find, and um, they reinforce the mentality that you you can't have kind of role specific or hire people that aren't the jack of all trades, but they're good at one thing or they can support the overall effort, not be the effort themselves. And uh, that's a little bit of kind of the entrepreneur's trap is um, they, they struggle here because they're, they're, they're a, a hand, handful, maybe two handfuls of really capable people, but they, they just lack um, the, the only way to grow. And it becomes impossible to do this is find yet that next jack of all trades person and, and add them to the staff. The, the organization just gets too big. The needs get too big to just rely on these kind of uh, single person players. Yeah, it'd be great if you could grow the company with all A and A plus players, but the reality is not everyone is A plus, and you got to figure out uh, you know how to get past that. Can't just keep yeah. replicating yourself. <laughs> so yeah, you know what? Some of our advice in working with uh, folks that are at this level would be to then um, start thinking about that as part of your hiring practice. Do you really need to always find that uh, next uh, unicorn, or what ways can you kind of divide up? Um, the responsibilities, everything that you're, the many hats that you're wearing, and how can you start uh, finding people that are good at those particular things so you can at least take off one or two of the hats and start um, passing them in different directions. The other thing that we would recommend in this phase, like we said, that, you know, you're just relying on technical hustle, but start thinking about what is it that you do to make projects successful. What are the repeatable things that always get done? We always kick off projects this way. We always um, communicate with the customer in this manner and then start having that become your first incarnation of this is our project methodology. And, and the, when you're working on our team, we expect these sorts of things to be done with the project, for a project and have those sorts of things to be done consistently. So um, you can get over uh, some of those um, you know, mistakes that aren't learned tend to be repeated um, and start building that tribal knowledge of here's what we do to have projects be more consistently successful. Yeah. Brian, do you just, want to talk about that yeah, three-legged stool at the end there? 
Sure. Um, so what, one of the things, again, getting back to the A players and things like that, you know, the reason they can be Lone Rangers is quite often they're, they have the capacity, they have the ability to be more than just the technical delivery side of it. You know, they can be an effective project manager. They can be, you know, a strong technical person, a uh, strong technical manager, technical lead type person. And they also typically have a strong client relationship management skills to make a good client manager as well. And, uh, you know, in the early stages, if you can find those people that can wear all those hats successfully, you know, that's the, those are typically more of the unicorn type people. What you'll find is, uh, you know, most people will tend to be good at one or maybe two of those things. It's really hard finding people that are really strong in all three. Uh, the other aspect is, is that, you know, it's just a matter of bandwidth and the time it takes to properly address those roles as well. And uh, it's at this stage that those roles start to become a little bit clearer and that we need to uh, bring attention to those roles and how we're going to address them effectively as the company grows. Yeah. Yeah. And I see we have admin here, um, kind of grayed out because that's not always part uh, of this size of organization, but it is something that we would highly recommend to do, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs at this stage to do is, is get that sort of help. Um, those things that can be done by someone in a more administrative capacity can really relieve a lot of the, I'll say busy work, not that it's not important to be done, but those things that can be done by non-technical people start introducing it as a concept early. Uh, I know we have uh, one of our business management peer groups um, that is targeted for companies that, that are kind of in this size and shape. Um, that's one of the things they talk about and have recommended to each other is uh, bringing on admin staff, whether that's a full-time person or part-time person to start taking care of those tasks for the entrepreneurs so that can, they can stay focused on the technical aspect back to the business, uh, uh, which is, you know, uh, and, and winning sales, uh, usually the entrepreneur is the, you know, primary seller at that point. Um, there's plenty of tasks for the entrepreneur to do. And so and finding ways to relieve uh, other tasks is, is certainly uh, a good idea. All right, let's m move. Uh, before we get to the next phase, I just quickly wanted to touch on, uh, we do see this with uh, some system integration organizations. We call it the pod model. Um, it's kind of a way to delay actually getting to the next phase that we'll talk about. And it typically happens if there are two or three kind of co-owners uh, in the, this entrepreneurial phase. They'll come up with the idea of, okay, things are getting too complex. So, Joe, you take these five engineers. Bill, you take these five engineers, and I'll take these four. And it just kind of makes the entrepreneurial phase persist longer. They, they really haven't uh, started to tackle the uh, some of the things we'll talk about in the additional phases. Um, but we do see it. And, and, and with that, you know, you might be able to get grow a little bit bigger, say get to the 15 or 20 person range. But uh, and, and our my opinion, our opinion, I believe um, it's not really going at um, what's needed to really make the organization to grow. You're just kind of dividing the problem and, and replicating it three a uh, couple of three times. Uh, Brian, I know you you want to distinguish that between the so-called franchise model. So maybe speak to that. Yeah. So the pub model is, you know, it's, it's really an offshoot, you know, an extension of, you know, the that single uh, point entrepreneur model that you showed in the previous slide. And, um, you know, again, like typically for most companies, they tend to replicate what they've been doing. And uh, this is, you know, probably the most common thing that we'll see is that, okay, I want to you know, get an, another piece of my business going out here and you find that strong seller doer that can uh, uh, essentially follow that same model going forward. The challenge with this is uh, they tend to bring uh, some of their own uh, particular biases, influences, things like that, and process methodologies that aren't necessarily consistent across all seller doers. So what you end up having is seller doers pulling in there's some commonality, but you'll find that there's aspects that they're pulling in different directions. We're not all marching to the same drummer. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is really where, you, you know, management starts to stand back and say, geez, you know, we can't keep doing projects this way. You know, we keep having failures here. We have a failure there. Uh, we're not following this process. And so it comes back to saying, how do we develop a standards-based organization where we can leverage the innovation and you know, provide the autonomy for our engineers and the uh, those uh, project managers, et cetera, 
uh, to do what they do best, but we need to follow our best practices. We need to follow the common processes uh, or the processes that work commonly across the board. So as you grow this out, you effectively want to franchise what works best. And that is those standards, those processes, and you want to overlay that within this model. And so that's where, you know, again, some of these hurdles start to come into place and integrators start to, uh, you know, recognize that, hey, we need to do more than just have a bunch of superheroes in our organization. We need to be able to uh, have those superheroes execute on uh, common and best practices. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that distinction. You know, a franchise model would be you really do address the things that need to be successful, the processes and the organizational structure that we'll talk about in the coming phases, and then franchise that, duplicate that, that, that well-honed process and well-honed structure and kind of franchise that to open up places in different regions and whatnot. And that can be quite successful. Whereas this one, you haven't done that first step, right? You, you, you're, you're really operating, as you described it, Brian, as almost three fairly independent businesses. Yes, they probably share some some ideas and uh, and whatnot, but they have they're really kind of three mini groups and that haven't um, that don't have the combined ump that we're talking about. So I think it'll make more sense as we go through and we talk about okay, um, barring going down the pod model path. Typically, what will happen when we get to this next stage is the first basic structure uh, uh, structure phase is what we call. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point, um, there's kind of some good news and bad news. Um, if you put the project methodology in place, projects are more consistently profitable. Um, so you can kind of minimize the damage of the, the bad project, so to speak. Everybody knows that not every project go swimmingly but you can kind of you have enough methodology in place to you know minimize the the cuts and the bruises that come from them so um uh you know the the revenues will still vary but um you know you have a little bit more stability kind of uh from month to month um but but the business does become increasingly hard to manage uh financially um, you got a lot of moving parts at this point. Um, uh, lots of times the leaders j- just can't get good reports. The organization's getting big enough that they can't touch and feel every single thing that's going on, uh, uh, but they haven't layered in enough kind of structure and enough reporting to be able to get good information about where things actually sit. Um, uh, the the tracking of uh, of things like like the labor in the projects cost in the projects it just is is, is it, you know it's becoming labor intensive um, they may not have invested in a system that you know brings forth that um, so it's you you can kind of steer and guide the organization effectively uh, and the other common aspect that I would say is is when it comes to like strategic planning I'd say typically the uh, the uh, this exists more informally, you know, the entrepreneur may be having kind of conversations with a couple of his kind of lead engineers and colleagues uh, about kind of where the business is going, but there's no, no real structure. They just, they just need to grow, you know, and they don't know, they don't know how, they don't really have a plan on this is really, you know, what we want to go after, what we want to be good at. Um, uh, they, they still, uh, you know, are, um, you know, just have a, a general sense of what they want to do there. A lot of times they are generalist, right, Brian? They, they, they'll they take on pretty much any project. They don't haven't really said what they're really good at. Does it have revenue? It's a good project. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then the other aspect is, is uh, given that that's the sort of thing, there's still, um, I'd say there's still kind of heroic efforts going into projects at this point. Um, and, and the entrepreneur is probably burning the midnight hour um, on the business and um, maybe some, quite frankly, sleepless nights about kind of, hey, man, where is this all really headed? Right. So let, let's focus in. I know this presentation is more about the people aspect of it, Brian. So let's talk some about the people uh, uh, considerations. Um, you know, typically, uh, in this phase, we're still in that seller-doer model, meaning that the person that um, is the primary face to the client is convincing the client th- that uh, the organization can, can and will do the work. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that a lot of times that's still primarily um, the, the owner is, is still the primary seller-doer. 
and rain making a lot of the work for, for the rest of the staff. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, at this point though, it, when you're getting to this 15 to 20 people, so 25 people sort of stage, you do start need to thinking if you haven't already before that you need to kind of create different jobs um, and have different descriptions for those jobs on this is the role that you're really playing in the organization kind of as it's, you know, charted out there, you have an owner, you have set somebody in charge of sales and marketing, you have somebody in charge of finance and HR, and then you have, you know, probably senior engineers layer then. Um, and I, I kind of put Joe there in several boxes because the, the wearing multiple hats translates into you're occupying more than one spot in your organizational chart. The, 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 Brian, the key, is that the key, yeah, the key thing, what you see? Yeah, absolutely. The key thing at this at this stage is, you know, people are getting past, you know, the you know the, that you know startup environment and recognizing that, you know, what they're doing isn't just one job or one role, and they're starting to differentiate in some of the things they're doing, and hopefully starting to differentiate in terms of, yeah, these are things I'm good at, and these are things I'm not good at. And at some point here, Joe is going to realize that, yeah, I really need to peel off the sales or I need to peel off the finance or whatever the case might be. And so you start to differentiate, this starts to roll out and you start to look for people with other skills, other particular specialties, other than just simply trying to replicate yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that we have this as the, you know, identifying the gaps, What you'll find when you start really becoming aware of the relative strengths and weaknesses is, you know, who, who is ultimately responsible for the vision and looking for the future. That, that's likely the entrepreneur, but not always. Um, often when it is the entrepreneur, they're so busy and kind of um, chasing chasing the clients and chasing the future that they are challenged now with this organization being this side and, and running the business. So that's that's kind of the second say say role is who's the organizer of the business? Who 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 is um, not not the visionary, not the one that's out there kind of with the clients, you know, coming up with here's the type of projects we should be doing and whatnot. This is somebody that's more running the operations of the business. Uh, a kind of a different role and a different skill set. Uh, <clears throat> and then what you'll see on the engineering team, certainly by this time, is some of them have more technical aptitude for uh, architecting the solution to the problem, and some of them are better about uh, actually managing the project, setting up the schedule, designing the task, making sure that the project's uh, uh, on track, so to speak. Um, and those those don't necessarily live in the same person and likely there may be combinations of it, but some, you'll, you'll need to start seeing how some people are more adept or less adept in, in those sorts of differentiations. Yeah. I'd say, you know, on the sales and marketing is, that, you know, it's in this phase that, you know, I, mo they, they think, okay, we, we need to hire a salesperson and they'll go out and they'll hire a person from one of the product companies and go, okay, we need you to come in and, and sell. But um, uh, as I'm sure you can talk to Brian, selling a service is quite different than selling a product. Yeah, well, absolutely. I and mean, that's often one of the, the challenges they run into is identifying how to do the solution sell. Um, is a whole lot different than selling a product. And one of the things that we see with a lot of integrators when they're starting out and they're starting to create a sales force is they'll often bring in salespeople that sold product in the past. And in many cases, they'll struggle. And, uh, you know, sometimes they figure it out just depending on the individual and stuff like that. But uh, in many cases, uh, we'll see a lot of integrators go through a lot of salespeople um, as they try and hit on the right person that gets it. And uh, in, in order to move forward, so that 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 that's a difficult uh, that's a difficult role to fill. And um... yeah, absolutely. And then you know, with respect to getting help, you know, I'd say typically in this phase, you know, the 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 entrepreneur has um, gotten some help with the finance and HR aspects. Um, you know, maybe brought in a person, maybe a bookkeeper or something to kind of help that. But they're typically not in a leadership position. Um, but financial management is absolutely paramount in this phase. They're just too, too, potentially too big a financials issue that can quite frankly sink the organization. So um, you, you need to be able to have someone that can steward and create an effective project accounting system, not just dumping all of the engineering hours in, in a single bucket 
and you know seeing if we have enough money to you know pay everybody and pay our bills by the end of the month but you need to be able to kind of you know budget this is how much we think this project's going to take track to see uh whether or not you're within that budget um and you know have that um be able to help you predict whether or not projects are going to be financially successful um Anyway, so that that is that is another you know when you're at this size of organization, you really need to start finding who is a person that's going to be somebody that can be account accountable as we'll see accountability <laughs> leading to the next phase, but um, yeah, accountable for uh, the finances of the business. There's, there's there's probably one other thing we should highlight too at at this stage, and you know it's not just at this stage we'll we'll see it actually at various stages, but it, we'll often see it start to really highlight at this stage and as the company's growing there uh modifying their structure how do we organize ourselves and what positions do we put people in there's a strong tendency and that out of necessity uh to it i might add that you uh, structure yourself around the people skill sets rather than identifying these are the roles that I need to make my business work. I need these functions. I need people to drive these functions. You tend to structure it around the individuals themselves and their particular strengths, which can end up evolving into a structure that's not necessarily particularly scalable, workable, uh, longer term. And at some point, you do have to kind of get back to say, okay, what's the right structure for my business and populate those roles, positions accordingly, as opposed yeah. to just building my structure around the strengths or, or lack of strengths or capabilities that the individuals have. And, uh, you know, it's, and it's an important differentiation and, uh, it becomes, it, as the company yeah. grows, it becomes a bigger and bigger factor. Yeah. That, that leads perfectly into this accountability phase, Brian, that you're talking about. And like we said, this isn't, a, isn't necessarily as linear as we're presenting it, but it does put it in bite-sized chunks that we can talk about. So, um, so anyways, this accountability phase. So uh, as described here, 25 to 50 people, um, the, the organization uh, has some uh, structure in place and it really becomes more about the accountability. Some of the, some of the things that Brian kind of alluded to there is those roles come with, you are responsible for the finances. You are responsible for the operations. You are responsible for the revenue generation. What does that mean? Whether they're KPIs, whether they're metrics associated with that, and do you have the right butt in the right seat? Somebody that um, uh, get get it gets it, wants it, and is capable of doing that that job. And it, in absence of thinking about that in advance and planning for that advance, you can find out that you end up having somebody in, in the wrong seat, so to speak. Um, that you realize, oh, we form that role around that person. That's not really what we need, and those can lead to some difficult conversations. Um, so anyways, I say the entrepreneur is fearing uh, taking the next step. What I mean by that is that, um, at this size of organization, you're really needing to delegate significant responsibilities to other people in the organization. You're not the only, uh, sole person responsible for everything at this point. And, and there can be some fear of that is letting go of that accountability for that but better that that's kind of defined here's what i expect for you how do you here's the job description here's the kind of kpis that i need to see for this to be successful so that i can relinquish um that and not be afraid to do that um is what happens in this accountability phase brian anything you want to add before we move on to um the uh, kind of the people considerations yeah yeah, just I'll, I'll just touch since you got that uh, five dysfunction model yeah. pyramid uh, on the side there. Uh, accountability or avoidance of accountability is obviously one of the big ones, and we, we tend to focus this phase around accountability. But uh, you know, it's not just at an individual level. You know, uh, it's you know, there's there's a lot of aspects as you're starting to grow and you're branch out and you're adding people. How do we ensure we've got team accountability, self accountability, holding others accountable? This just starts to grow and grow and unfortunately what we'll often see is uh, a lot of companies sometimes struggle with these aspects of accountability as the company's growing and things are getting a little bit more unruly uh from a from an organizational perspective um but uh, these these things come back to uh uh you know identifying 
and and managing that. You know, the first part is identifying these 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 challenges, these hurdles, and then uh, how, how do you move forward and uh, bring, bringing that together. And it's not just at an individual; it is at a team level. And when you start looking at things at a team level, whether it's your management team, your project team, however you self-organize around teams within your organization these other aspects of the various dysfunctions that you see in that pyramid become much more highlighted, much more critical uh, yeah. during, during this uh, evolution of your growth and something yeah. you can pay close attention to. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up, Brian. And that's something I know that we use with our clients. If they're uh, these sort of things in this accountability uh, pyramid here are, are uh, if that resonates with any of you, then, um, uh, either you can pick up that uh, five dysfunctions of team by Lencioni and, and use that with your team yourself, or that's something you know. If you need some help, we can we can certainly uh, help facilitate that. Um, let's let's jump in then. Okay, at this size organization, um, it, we kind of Brian gave the lead in on this, but you know the organizational chart is not just here's the people um, that we have in the organization who they happen to report to. It's almost the reverse. Uh, a lot of times we, we recommend you fill out your organizational chart um, with no, nobody's name in it. This is, this is how we need to organize as a business to be able to continue to grow it to the next level and then fit the names back into the organizational chart uh, as it makes sense. Um, uh, that, that, you know, those, those are, are job functions and their roles and they have descriptions with them. And it just happens that a person uh, ends up filling that different role, or you may need to find that you need to develop somebody's skills to fill that role, or maybe seek that even outside the or current organization. Um, uh, for, forgive the redundancy, but like Brian says, this is not completely linear, but that kind of right person, right seat, you know, appreciating the different skills for those different roles, your different career paths for those skills and, and making sure that um, that you're putting people in positions that they can be successful for themselves and successful for the organization. Um, so a um, couple other uh, things here uh, as far as the people and the kind of people processes, um, people management is becoming important. Um, you know, People are concerned about their careers and the size of organization. Where are they going? How are they developing? Uh, you, you know, I know Brian. We see in the, in this face, there's there's now a starting to be that kind of uh, career ladder sort of concept of what does it mean to be a <clears throat> junior engineer or senior engineer or level one, two, three engineer? Um, those are becoming important to people to know, uh, know that they're. Um, that they're progressing, that they're they're as they're as they're living their lives, that they're getting better at this thing. Um, what does it mean to be better at this thing? Um, those so that uh, how do you you know manage people? How do you help them set their goals? How you know how much time should be devoted to training? All of those things uh, uh, are become uh, you know become a focus of what the organization needs to get good at. <clears throat> Yeah, and this this is something that we typically see comes later in the evolution. You know, a, a lot of things get figured out at different stages, but uh, you know, the 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 HR aspects of you know defining uh, career paths within your organization. What does that look like? How do we uh, not just give a person a position to allow them to be you know super tech geek, but you know what's what's the path forward beyond tech geek and within the organization and going forward from there. And these these aspects and fleshing that out and being able to paint a picture, a few forward-looking picture in the organization be has become, it's always been important, but has become increasingly important. There's been a much more of a, a spotlight on those aspects over the last number of years than uh, what we've seen in the past. And uh, so extre extremely important. Right, and as, as you can see, as we kind of laid out in this very simple org chart, but at this time, you know, the org chart is looking much more like business functions in an organization, not, you know, if you recall back to it was Joe, Dave, Bill, you know, whatever. It was just a very simple, here, here's the list of, you know, the, the handful of people that are in this, uh, in this business working shoulder to shoulder. Now you do have gone through this setting up the structure, setting up the accountability, and now you don't have just a bunch of seller doers. You really have people that are... Um, occupying roles within an organization and have that kind of defined set of responsibilities and accountabilities. And that 
you know, provides the oomph that is needed to, to, you know, manage organizations this size, much less grow. At, at, at some point, the company has to get past that the organization chart is more than just the phone list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very well put. All right, let's move on. Um, so uh, from that point, you know, get this in place and then um, the scaling up phase. Uh, in, my sen- uh, in my mind, you know, you've, you've addressed a lot of the things that we've talked about so far. And it, it's a nice spot to be in the sense that once you have that in place, you do have the ability to kind of scale up the organization. Um, uh, the, the one of the big questions is, is sales to fuel the business. That kind of comes up at this stage. Okay, we got got everything we need. How how do we how can we you know find enough business to have this uh, to to feed the beast, so to speak? Um, so you know, I, I would say kind of in this. Uh, the business is stable, but yeah, it may have kind of outgrown its leaders. Um, the second level management is kind of stressed and um, the strategic plans for the organization tend, tend to get more important. Um, not that they weren't important before, but really you need to have those kind of strategic discussions to know what kind of business that you really want to continue to lean into and become known for uh, to have the business continue to grow. Yeah, there's... There's a, a real important stage that you know the integrators want to look at in their business, and it doesn't it doesn't get particularly highlighted as a, a particular hurdle or a particular point. You know, if you go back to your you know opening slides there, but it's getting out of. But we you know we kind of touched upon it here. You know, starting in that entrepreneurial phase, but ultimately at some point, particularly at this phase, you know, you're really looking to try and get out of that opportunistic growth model and into one of plan control growth and making that transition from that opportunistic, very entrepreneurial driven type of organization to that plan controlled growth uh, phase uh, is, is really difficult. And it's not just a process issue. It's not just a matter of, well, if I start, you know, doing strat planning and doing all these other things that happens, it's, it's a mindset as well, you know, and even though we'll see companies that will, you know, start to put in some of those, uh, more mature processes, say around strategic planning, things like that, uh, the mindset can still be much geared towards the next shiny object. And mm-hmm. oh, here's an opportunity over here or an opportunity over there. And getting getting past that, ensuring that management, the people that are driving your business uh, at this stage of the game, there's typically more than one. Uh, getting past that is super critical. That's not to say that you're not going to, you know, if you see a $10 bill on the sidewalk, yeah, you're probably going to pick it up. But you know, don't, you know, you don't want to be chasing opportunities that disrupts your plan for growth and getting into this mode. And it's a real critical one of that plan control growth. You know, how do we mature our business going forward is, is a tough one. So it's a process issue. It's a mindset issue. There's a, there's a lot of things that come into play here and getting the right people that have that uh, understanding and perception of their, of the business and what they're doing is uh, absolutely critical. Awesome. All right. Uh, so some people considerations at this uh, phase, um, you know, we, we, the, the CEO and the uh, CEO, that visionary integrator roles, getting that really well understood between those and not having the, uh, the visionary who wants the CEO typically that wants to chase the shining object kind of running around um, the CEO, so to speak, and, and, almost distracting the organization to chase the, the next shiny object, uh, you know, having good working uh, structure uh, between uh, those typically pretty strong individuals um, is, is, is a, certainly very important. Um, at this point, you're probably, you know, at the stage of looking at, you know, you need to have people that are business unit leaders. And what I mean by that, they, they, they now are responsible for the entirety of that business, uh, an area of the business that uh, the company is is going after. Um, so they're they're not just responsible for the solutioning of those efforts, um, but they're they're responsible uh, for uh, the client um, uh, interactions, the sales operations. Um, in some sense, they're their own mini business. I want to say like they've been cut off and they're separate. They're still 
part of the main organization and it's a little bit kind of brian like the franchise concept that you were talking about before they're using the processes of the the, the mothership right they're they're, they're uh, but they are tasked with the entirety of an aspect of the business mm -hmm. and have that kind of sales alignment to to drive the revenue they need and they're being tasked with generating for that particular business <clears throat> Uh, on the technical management side, um, uh, we kind of alluded to the three-legged stool in the beginning that there are kind of three ways to look at a project. You can look at it from the technical aspect. You can look at it from the project management aspect, meaning kind of just the, the how well it's going from a financial and a, is it on schedule and budget type of sort of thing. And then there's this third perspective, the customer customer management is at the end of the day, is it? Is the client going to be satisfied? Does it meet their needs sort of thing? Um, at this size of organization, those those are separated roles that are, you know, kind of well-defined and well understood. Depending on the size of the project, it may have somebody responsible for each of the three uh, legs of the stool, so to speak. And at this size of the organization, you're typically um, uh, have the formation of a, uh, the PMO, a project management organization. So, so the project managers, um, uh, which are typically separated now from the technical, uh, more technical folks, they may have a technical background, but they're they're hundred percent of their responsibility is managing the projects themselves. Just the, as I mentioned, the, the finances and the schedule and whatnot. That's that's their task. They're not they're not rolling up their sleeves and doing the technical part of the solution. And they get formed into a group so they can share best practices and here's what we do to make projects successful and make sure they're on track. And if they're on track, here's the sorts of things we can levers we can pull to get them back on track. And then last, the, the kind of HR processes, um, that has been uh, honed into formal processes or dedicated people to, to uh, the human resources aspect of your organization. Um, they, they're tasked with um, uh, leading the efforts. I don't know if they have the final decision, but they, they have, you know, they know how many folks need to be brought into the organization this year, and they're in charge of making sure the recruiting efforts happen and also the retention efforts happen, managing, you know, what the benefits for the, the folks are uh, and what the development uh, vehicles are, learning management system, things like that. that they, they are a formal support staff for the entirety of the organization. Yeah, the, the the big thing, and you know, some of these things come in different ways at different times to different mm -hmm. degrees. But what we'll see, just generally speaking, is a real maturation of the business in terms of process and in terms of role definition. On uh, you know what people are doing, you know, particularly you know, particularly on that technical and side. Um, on the, the the BD side is typically maturing as well. Again, getting past that opportunistic and the plan control growth. The one thing that you know I would, would caution folks that we we see here sometimes is that you know these are all these three areas as a whole are are really big and really become critical considerations for a lot of companies. And it can be very easy to dive in deep into one and you know we'll sometimes you know we'll see folks get focused on the you know the technical or the hr the internal aspects of the organization um at the expense of the ongoing external development um so or or vice versa uh so you want to be sure when you're getting to this point and you're going into that maturation phase that you're keeping a balanced approach to looking at all these aspects of the business you don't want to get uh, too uh internally navel gazing at the expense of keeping work coming in the door. Um, and like I said, we do see those uh, uh, imbalances occur at, uh, uh, at different points along the way. All right. Um, so I see we're at our 45 minute mark, Brian. So as usually we're long winded, so I'll try to wrap this up. But um, the next phase, you know, we call diversification phase is once you've gotten 
as best you can, all the things that we've talked about thus far, uh, then you have a business that kind of scalable at kind of the business level. And how do we take this business and diversify it? Uh, you, you know, you're up uh, 100 plus people, more 25 to more 50 million type of, of size business. And then you're, you're going after kind of vertical markets. You're probably getting into developing more kind of product sort of solution, these sort of things. Um, quite frankly, we could spend an entire uh, hour just on this presentation. So we'll probably just have to kind of uh, leave that to the side for uh, for the moment. If, you, if you're at that level and, and would like some more thoughts or advice, we could, you know, come in and um, kind of uh, tell you some of our insights at that level. So just want to wrap it up saying, uh, you know, I know we're talking to the emerging leaders here. Um, and a lot of this is about, you know, what uh, the folks in this audience can do to, uh, or should be doing to improve themselves and therefore be bigger contributors within their organization. So just some parting thoughts about um, uh, leadership development. We have this kind of graphic that we use, you know, start with yourself, kind of who, who you are, what your strengths are, uh, recognizing that you may operate differently from others, things that are often lumped into this area of emotional intelligence, um, learning how to work with a, a team, uh, eventually learning how to manage people, and eventually learning how to, uh, you know, embrace and take on parts of the organization, kind of just a way of thinking about evolving yourself over time. Has different aspects as we've listed over there. Some of that is professional training. Some of that is coaching and, and mentoring, which you may have available in your organization. Um, you know, typically not your boss, but someone that you can go to for for advice. Uh, networking. Um, you guys may know we we uh, are standing up as many peer groups as we can for the community, so that you can learn from each other. Um, and if that's of interest, that's something we can, you know, follow up with you. Just uh, reach out to Brian or I, and uh, we'll see if there's a, a good peer group that with similar roles and responsibilities that you can both impart your wisdom as well as learn from others. Um, so anyways, that's about all the time we have today. I hope that was helpful to you guys. Um, I think it's going to open up to some breakout sessions here.